Okay. All right. Uh, to all the grade 12 learners who are doing life sciences, good morning, guys. So our lesson for today will be on exam preparation for paper one. As you remember that you will be writing your final examination next month in November. So let us move straight into our presentation. Okay, Life Sciences Paper 1. And then today's date, it is the 6th of October 2021. And then I'm sure on the screen you see this guy. And then this guy is saying, use your examination guidelines. So please, learners, remember that when you prepare for your final examination, and then you should have your notes in hand, and then and also the previous question papers. And then please don't forget also to use your examination guidelines. And then let us start first with the format of the paper. And then you still remember that uh, for both paper one and paper two, and then we have section A and section B. Section A, short answer uh, questions such as multiple choice terminology, and then columns or statements and matching items. And then you still remember again in section A, we have the data response questions, which will be question 1.4 and question 1.5. And then again in section B, we have two questions in section B, and then it will be question two, which will be out of 50 marks. And then again, we also have question three, which will also be out of 50 marks. And then they will both make 100 marks. And then the total of the paper will be 150. So you still remember that we are no more having section C, which is the essay in our papers. And then let us look at the distribution of topics for November 2021 examination. So this is what we have for paper one. And then reproduction in vertebrates, which is our first topic. And then you still remember that it is out of eight marks. And then human reproduction, it will be out of 41 marks. And then responding to the environment, humans, which is human nervous system. And then it will be out of 54 marks. And then responding to the environment, plants, meaning the plant hormones. And then it, uh, they will be out of 13 marks. And then the last topic of paper one, which is endocrine and homeostasis in humans. And then uh, both the topics will be out of 34 marks. And then the total again, 150. And then let us look at the basic technical points when writing the exam. So point number one, we have question one, two, and three must start on a new page. So please guys, remember that you have to make sure that you start each and every question on a new page. So remember, let us say for instance, when we start with section A, it will be section A, question one, and then uh, question 1.1, 1.1.1 up to 1.1.10. And then question 1.2, 1.3, which is match, and then 1.4, 1.5. And then it means that when you start qu with question 2, you will have to start question 2 on a new page. And then bullet number 2, after each sub-question, draw a line. And then this simply means that, and then I will also make an example with section A. Section A, question 1.1, which is multiple choice, you will write 1.1.1, 1.1.2, 1.1.3, up to 1.1.10. And then after that, you draw a line. And then you move to question 1.2, which is biological terms, 1.2.1, 1.2.2, and then 1.2.3 up to 1.2.8 maybe, or 1.2.10. And then you draw a line. And then the same with question 1.3, 1.4, 1.5. And then after that, you move to question 2. So remember that you have to start question 2 on a new page. And then you will start with question 2.1. And then it will be 2.1.1. 2.1.2, 2.1.3, and then you draw a line. You move to question 2.2, 2.2. So please remember that. And then graphs, 
tables and drawings must have a caption or a heading. So please, guys, remember that in life sciences, when you draw, draw with your pencil. Draw with your pencil. Either you draw your graph, your table, or any diagram. Draw with a pencil, and then after that, you label with your pen. And then please remember that all the drawings, they should have the what? The headings or captions. And then use a ruler or protractor and compass when drawing the graphs, please. And then our first topic, like as I have said, that it is reproduction in vertebrates. And then you still remember that reproduction in vertebrates, it uh, counts uh, how many marks? Eight marks. We have the reproductive strategies, external fertilization and internal fertilization. Please remember the definitions or the difference between this. And then we also have bullet number two, ovipari, ovovivipari and vivipari. You will also see these things on your examination. And then amniotic egg and then the labels. Please remember that you have to know the labels of the amniotic egg. And then again, the functions of the chorion, amnion and allantois. And then also we have the precocial and altricial development. And then we also have parental care. And then it has been found that learners cannot distinguish between different types of reproductive strategies. And also, again, they cannot apply the knowledge to examples. So please, learners, make sure that you revise these things. Know the definitions of ovipari, ovovivipari, and vivipari. And then let us go back to the definitions of these reproductive strategies. And then you still remember that with ovipari, this is what we have. It is a method of reproduction in which eggs are laid and embryos develop outside the mother's body within the egg. And then again, this is what we have. Amniotic egg, it is a type of egg that is produced by oviparous base and egg laying mammals. And then the second method of reproductive strategy, we have the ovovivipari. It is a method of reproduction in which young develop from eggs that are kept within the mother's body, but they are separated from her body by the egg membranes, and then they are then born live. And then another one, it is vivipari. It is a method of reproduction in which the fetus develops in the mother's uterus and it is nourished through an umbilical cord. And then on the next slide, this is what we have again, still on oviparous. And then if you look at this diagram, we have examples here. And then the eggs with shells are laid outside the female's body into a nest and continue to develop. And then hatching when development is complete. And then we have examples here. We have the base and some reptiles. And then look at these examples that we have or the pictures that we have here. And then viviparous, the embryo develops inside the uterus and obtains the nutrients from the mother's body through the placenta. And then look at the examples that we have here of the mammals. And then the female gives birth to live young when the gest uh, gestation or the gestation, you still remember that we are referring to the period of pregnancy. Okay, when gestation period is complete. And an example here we have the mammals. And then ovoviviparous, the development of the embryo is inside the mother's body, but the embryo, it obtains the nutrients from the egg yolk. And then remember that with this one, uh, let us move to the next bullet. It says that the mother only acts as a protection or shelter for the developing embryo. And then we have examples here. And then on this slide, we have the summary of ovipari, ovovivipari, and vivipari. And then the most important things here are these ones. Look at uh, the first row. We have uh, under fertilization. 
And then with oviparis, so please remember that it can either be external or internal. And then ovoviviparis fertilization, it is internal. And then with vivipari fertilization, it is also internal. And then you still remember that vivipari, and then example, it is mammals. And then development of the embryo with ovipari external to the body of the female, but with ovoviviparis the development of the embryo, it is inside the body of the female and then vivipari inside the female's body. And then again, we also have the nutrition and the type of the egg. And then let us also look at precocial and altricial development. So please remember that with precocial, Young are mature and able to move directly after birth or hatching. They are able to defend for themselves and feed without parental care. And then they also have the feathers and they are able to fly. And then eyes are open. And then we have examples here of precocial development. And then altricial, young are born helpless and then they cannot protect, feed themselves or defend for themselves. And then they have downy feathers, and then we have examples here. And then this is a summary of precocial and altricial development. And then you, uh, when you look at this slide, for diagram number A, it represents the precocial development. And then diagram number B, it is altricial development. And then let us look at the development of the body. And then for precocial, well developed but altricial it is underdeveloped and then eyes after birth for precocial you still remember that the eyes are open and then for altricial the eyes are closed and then presence of feathers and then they have feathers for precocial and then b which is altricial and then they are usually naked without the feathers and then parental care required for precocial you still remember that low degree of parental care it is required and then high degree of parental care is required for altricial development and then mobility young can move soon after birth and then for altricial they cannot move and then we have the last one under the yolk amount in egg and then for precocial development, greater quantity, and then lower quantity in altricial development. And then let us move to the amniotic egg. And then when you look at this uh, slide, we have the diagram of the amniotic egg here, and then together with the labels. So please remember, um, you have to be able to label this diagram, and then again, the functions of this extra embryonic membranes and then uh, when we talk about the extra embryonic membranes and then you still remember that we are referring to the amnion chorion allantois and the yolk sac so please make sure that you also know the functions of this extra embryonic membranes and then now we move to the second topic which is human reproduction and then human reproduction, you know that it is out of 41 marks. And then another thing which is very important when it comes to this, please remember the male reproductive system, you have to be able to label this diagram, please. And then again, it has been found that learners don't know the functions of these three glands, the corpus gland, the prostate gland, and the seminal vesicle. And then let us look at the diagram of the male reproductive system. And then like as I have said that, please, you have to be able to label. And then again, you also have to be able to mention the functions of all these parts, but only the parts which are stipulated on your examination guidelines. And then let us look at these three glands. The first one, the top one, it is the seminal vesicle. And then most of the time, I refer to them as SP. C. The top one, it is the seminal vesicle, and then the middle one, it is the prostate gland, and then the bottom one, it is the corpus gland. So please make sure that you know the functions of these 
street lens. Seminal vesicle produces a nutrient-rich fluid that provides energy from the sperm, uh, for the sperm cell. And then we also have the prostate gland produces an alkaline fluid that neutralizes the acids produced in the vagina, which will kill the sperm cell. And then we also have another gland, which is the corpus gland, produces a mucus which helps with the movement of the sperm cell. So please make sure that you know this three lens. Like as I have said that it is SPC. S for the top one, seminal vesicle, and then the middle one, the prostate gland, and then the bottom one, it is C, which is the corpus gland. And then another thing, we also have these other labels, the first difference, which transports sperms from the epididymis to the urethra, and then we also have the epididymis, stores the sperm cells and allow uh, them to mature. And then we also have the testes, know the function of the testes, and then the urethra, not ureta. Urethra transports the semen and urine out of the body. And then again, urethra, okay, this is the same thing like this one. The structure of the female reproductive system, and then again with the structure, so please remember you have to know the labels, all the labels which have been stipulated on your examination guideline, and then together with the functions of those labels. And then on this slide, we have our diagram here of the female reproductive system. And then remember, we have the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, and then uterus, endometrium, and then this is the cervix, vagina, and the vulva. And then again, while we are still on the female reproductive system, this is what we have. And then it has been found that learners don't know the functions of the fallopian tubes. We have fallopian tubes here at A, and then we have B, which is the ovary. And then let us look at the function of the fallopian tubes. And then it is to transport the immature ovum as well as the developing zygote in the direction of the uterus. So this is the function of the fallopian tube. So please make sure that you know that function. And then we move to the gametes. You still remember that under the gametes we have the sperm cell and the ovum. So this is the diagram of the sperm cell. So please remember that you have to be able to draw the sperm cell and the ovum. And then again, you should also be able to label. And then another thing which is very important, know the functions of those labels. And then let us look at the first one, the sperm cell. We have the tail here and then we have the middle piece which contains uh, the mitochondria. And then this is the nucleus and the acrosome here on this part. And then we also have the diagram of the ovum and then follicle uh, cells, nucleus, cytoplasm and the jelly layer or layer of jelly. And then learners, like as I have said, learners must be able to draw the gametes. So please make sure that you are able to draw the structure of the sperm cell together with the structure of the ovum. And then again, be able to label, know the functions of these labels. Use only the labels as provided in the examination guidelines. So it means that you only have to know those labels which have been stipulated on your examination guidelines. And then we, oh yeah, on the slide, again, we still have the structure of the sperm cell. And then let us look at our notes here. The first, uh, oh yeah, uh, our first bullet here, we have the head. Here is the head. And then it contains the what? The acrosome that contains the enzymes to digest the membrane of the ovum during fertilization. And then another thing which is very important, we also have the nucleus, which contains the genetic material for inheritance. And then the middle piece, you remember that the middle piece, it contains what? It has the mitochondria. And then what will be the function of the mitochondria? It is to provide energy for the sperm movement. And then the tail again. Here is the tail for sperm movement. And then again, the structure of the ovum, the functions of the labels, and then we have the layer of jelly, and then it provides uh, for protection, and then we have the haploid nucleus, which contains genetic material also for inheritance, and then we also have 
the cytoplasm. So please make sure that you are able to draw the structure of the ovum and also to label and the functions of those labels. And then another thing which is very important learners, we have uh, under gametogenesis on this slide. And then uh, when you look at this slide, it has been indicated here that as stated in the exam guideline. So it means that for spermatogenesis and oogenesis, please you are not allowed to describe these two processes using your own ways. So it means that you have to describe them exactly the same way uh, in which they have been described on your examination guideline. So please make sure that you revise. You revise spermatogenesis and oogenesis. And then let us move to reproductive hormones and functions. And then again, it has been found that learners don't know the reproductive hormones. And then you still remember that our hormones here, it is oestrogen, progesterone, FSH, and LH. And then let us look at this diagram that we have on this slide. Okay, we have ovarian follicle here. And then we have our hormones here, FSH, LH, oestrogen, progesterone. And then ovum here, the process of ovulation in day 14 and then corpus luteum after uh, day 14. And then if you remember, look at these primary follicles, and then you still remember that under the influence of follicle-stimulating hormone, which is FSH, and then FSH, you remember that the function of FSH, it is to stimulate the development of the primary follicles. We have the primary follicles here. Into what? Into graphene follicle. And then after that, we have graphene follicle here, which will secrete oestrogen. And then look at the level of oestrogen here. And then the graphene follicle, like as I have said, that it will secrete oestrogen. And then after that, the oestrogen will also stimulate the hypothesis of pituitary gland to secrete LH. And then that is why you see LH here on day 14. And then you still remember that LH, what will be the function of LH, and then it will cause the, what, the Krafian follicle to rupture, and then it will release the ovum. Here is the ovum, and by which process? By the process of ovulation. And then again on this side, after ovulation, the ruptured Krafian follicle, it will now turn into what? Into corpus luteum. It will now turn into corpus luteum, and then it will secrete progesterone. That is why you see the level of progesterone on this side being high. And then the level of progesterone, if you look at this diagram, it is now declining. And then it means that fertilization did not take place. And then another thing from this diagram, which also explains that fertilization didn't take place. It is because of what? Look at the size of the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum, it is degenerating. So please make sure that you know these hormones. Okay, and then on this slide, we also have, um, again, uh, the diagram, this diagram, which shows all the four hormones that... Uh, we have just mentioned, and then look at this point. It is FSH, and then FSH hormones from the brain. And then you remember that FSH, you still remember that it is being secreted by what? By the hypothesis. And then it stimulates the development of the primary follicles into graphene follicles. And then after that, the graphene follicles, they will secrete oestrogen. Here is oestrogen here. And then let us look at the function here. They say it prepares the uterus for implantation by making it thick, vascular, and glandular. And then on this side, we also have the LH here on day 14. But according to this diagram, and then it means that ovulation takes place on day 14. And then it is because of the hormone LH. And then after that, we know that we will have progesterone on the site, which will be secreted by the corpus luteum. And then menstrual cycle, now we are moving to menstrual cycle. Menstrual cycle, you still remember that it is divided into two. 
and then it is the uterine and ovarian cycle. And then also another thing which is very important, the organs that change during menstruation, you still remember that it is the uterus and the ovaries. Okay, and then we have the diagrams here. A diagram that represents the ovarian cycle, the first diagram, and then the uterine cycle. So it means that all the events that are taking place in the ovary and then all the events that are taking place inside the uterus. Look at this diagram of the ovary. Okay, we have the primary follicles again here. And then under the influence of FSH, and then they develop into graphene follicle. And then they will secrete, you still remember that they will secrete the hormone oestrogen. And then oestrogen will stimulate the hypothesis to secrete what? LH. And then LH again on this side, you see we have the what? The process of ovulation here where an ovum will be released. And then because of the hormone LH. And then after that, the ruptured graphene follicle, it will now turn into the corpus luteum under the influence of the hormone LH and then which will secrete which hormone and then it will secrete progesterone and then uterine cycle you look at this stage and then it means that the endometrium from this point to this point and then it is shading and then after that the lining of the endometrium becomes thick and then after that, from this point to this point, the lining of the endometrium, again, it breaks. And then it means that fertilization did not take place. And then events again on the, uh, in the ovarian cycle. Here is the diagram of the ovary. And then these are the events that occur inside the ovary only. So the development of the graphene follicle under the influence of FSH. You will remember that we have said that FSH, it will stimulate the development of the primary follicles into graphene follicle. And then after, again, another thing which will take place here, it is the process of ovulation. Ovulation and changing of an empty graphene follicle to the corpus luteum under the influence of what? Of LH. So these are the events that take place where in the ovarian cycle and then the events in the uterine cycle this is what we have bullet number one oestrogen stimulates the endometrium to become thicker and develop more blood vessels so it means that it becomes vascular and glandular under the influence of progesterone and then this is what will happen the endometrium it becomes even thicker and to develop more blood vessels and glands and then ready to receive the embryo and then if the level of progesterone drops and then what will happen this is what you see from this diagram the level of progesterone it now drops and then it means that the lining of the endometrium breaks down and it is released and then by the process of menstruation and then we will have menstruation here and then now let us look at the stages between ovulation and implantation. This is our diagram here. And then if you look at this diagram, so this is what we have here. Look at um, number B, label number B, we have an ovum here and the sperm cell. So it means that the process of fertilization is taking place here. B, fertiliza fertilization. And then again, bullet number two, mitosis between number seven and number eight. Look at number seven. So it means that between number seven and number eight, and then the process of mitosis will take place. Or the cell division here, yeah, it will be mitosis between number seven and number eight. And then development of the zygote, number seven. You will remember that we have said that number B, because we have an ovum here and a sperm cell fertilization takes place. And then after that, we know that we will have a white, a zygote. So that is why we say number seven, it is the zygote. And then number eight, a ball of cells. 
and then it is morula. And then look at number nine. We have the blastocyst or blastula, a hollow ball of cells. And then the last one, it is the chorionic villi, which is number 11. So please make sure that you know the stages, the stages between ovulation and implantation. Implantation and gestation. So you still remember this diagram? So please make sure that again, on this slide, you have to know the functions of the following parts, the chorion and chorionic villi, amnion, amniotic cavity, and amniotic fluid, and then umbilical cord, including umbilical artery and umbilical vein, and then placenta. So please, again, make sure that you know the role of placenta in gestation. And then another thing which is very important, let us be able to define implantation and gestation. All right. And now we are done with human reproduction. So we are now moving to the next topic, which is responding to the environment, humans, which is human nervous system. And then you still remember that human nervous system, it is out of 54 marks. And then let us look at the introduction here. And then this is what we have. The nervous system involving the nerves and endocrine system involving the hormones are two components that help humans respond to the environment. And then human nervous system, again, the need for nervous system in humans. And then we have these two bullets here. Reaction to stimuli. Stimuli can be external or internal. And then bullet number two, we have coordination of the various activities of the body. So another thing which is important here, response to the environment involves both what? The nervous system and the endocrine system. So please remember that with the nervous system, this is what we have, or the difference between the nervous system and endocrine system. In nervous system, response is rapid, and then endocrine system, the response is slow. And then another difference, under the nervous system, this is what we have. Duration of the response is rapid, but with the endocrine system, the uh, duration of the response is slow. And then nervous system, again, another difference. Electrical impulse are sent, but with the endocrine system, this is what we have, the hormones. Hormones are secreted. And then impulse are sent through neurons in nervous system. And then hormones are sent through the blood with the endocrine system. So please, again, this is very important. Let us remember to revise these differences, the difference between the nervous system and endocrine system. And then on this next slide, this is what we have. Okay, we have a flow diagram here that represent the human nervous system. And then what is important here, is please remember that the central nervous system, we have the cent uh, human nervous system is divided into the central nervous system, which is the CNS here, and then PNS, it is the peripheral nervous system. And then peripheral nervous system, this is very important, you remember that it uh, consist of what the cranial and spinal nerves and then the central nervous system it is the brain and the spinal cord please remember that and then also again here we have autonomic and somatic nervous system and then this is where we have the sympathetic and parasympathetic you remember that they are part of the autonomic nervous system and then please remember that this is very important, learners. Adrenaline, you remember under the hormones. The hormone adrenaline is responsible for the sympathetic reaction. So just go and revise again the difference between the sympathetic and parasympathetic um, systems. And then we move to the parts of the human eye. Here is the diagram. So please, again, it is very important that you know the labels. Be able to label the structure of the human eye. 
and then the functions of all the parts which have been stipulated on your examination guideline. You still remember that we have the ciliary body here and then the suspensory ligament and then aqueous humor and then you remember inside here we have the vitreous humor and then here is the pupil of the eye and then the cornea and then the iris and the lens. And then on this side, we have the sclera, the choroid, and retina, the yellow spot, blind spot, the optic nerve. So please make sure that you know all these labels and the functions of these labels. And then you still remember that under the functioning of the eye, we have accommodation and pupillary mechanism. And then let us look at the difference between accommodation and pupillary uh, mechanism. And then on the first row, this is what we have under the stimulus. And then for accommodation, what will be the stimulus or the stimuli? It is the change in the distance of the object from the eye, whether an object is near or Far. But for pupillary mechanism, it is the change in light intensity. And then parts which are involved with accommodation, please remember that we have the lens, the suspensory ligaments, and the ciliary muscles. So these are the parts which are involved with accommodation. And then for pupillary mechanism, the parts which are involved, it is the pupil and then the radial muscles of the iris and the circular muscles of the iris. And then on the third row, this is what we have. The main change that must take place with accommodation, please remember that the main change, it is the shape of the lens. But with pupillary mechanism, it is the diameter of the pupil. And then what brings about the change above? And then in accommodation, it is the suspensory ligaments and ciliary muscles. And then for pupillary mechanism, we have the radial muscle of the iris and the circular muscles of the iris. All right. And then let us look at uh, pupillary mechanism under bright light or bright conditions and dim conditions. And then radial muscles of the iris, they relax in bright light. And then, but in dim light, the radial muscle of the iris, they contract. Here are the radial muscles, radial muscles. And then the circular, this one, which are in a circle shaped. So the radial muscles in bright light, they relax. But then in dim light, they contract. And then let us start first with this one of the bright light. And then the circular muscles of the iris, they contract. Here are the circular muscles. These ones with a, a, in a form or a shape of a circle. And then they contract. And then the pupil constrict. And then it means that it gets smaller. And then even when you look at this diagram, and then less light enters the eye. So this is what you have to say when you describe pupillary mechanism under bright conditions. And then under dim conditions, so please remember that the radial muscles of the iris, they contract on this, slide, uh, on this side. And then the circular muscles of the iris, now they relax in dim conditions. And then the pupil widens or it gets bigger. Look at the size of the people here. It is big and then more light enters the eye. So please, when you describe pupillary mechanism under dim conditions, and then this is what you have to say, please. And now let us move to accommodation. Accommodation for distant vision and then for near uh, vision. And then we have our diagram here, the ciliary muscle. So please remember that with accommodation, we have ciliary muscles and then the circular muscles. And then we find them where with, uh, when we deal with pupillary uh, mechanism. So accommodation, it has to do with the ciliary muscles and then circular, it is for pupillary mechanism. So let us look at accommodation for distant vision. Bullet number one, it says ciliary muscles relax. We have the ciliary muscles here. 
they relax. And then bullet number two, remember that the suspensory ligaments, they tighten. Please don't say suspensory ligaments contract. They don't contract, but they become tight or they tighten. And then tension on the lens increases. And then here is our lens. And then you say, you look and then look at the next point, uh, which is point number four. It says the lens is less convex or becomes flatter. And then number five, light rays are refracted or bent less. And then the light rays, bullet number six, are focused onto the retina. Please, you are not allowed to say not more light are focused on the retina. So you say light rays are focused onto the retina. And then when we move to accommodation for near vision, bullet number one, the ciliary muscles contract. And then we have the ciliary muscles. And then suspensory ligaments, they slack or slacken. Please don't say that they contract. And then the tension on the lens decreases. And then the lens becomes more convex or more rounder. And then the light rays are refracted or bent more. And then light rays are focused onto the retina. So this is accommodation for near and for far objects. So please make sure that you revise this. And then the structure and functions of the parts of the human ear. Now we move to the human ear using the diagram. And then let us look at this diagram. We have the pinna here, and then which is in the outer ear, and then the middle ear, and then the inner ear. You still remember these parts, the semicircular canals, and then the nerve brains here, the cochlea, the eustachian tube, hammer, anvil, and stirrups, and then you remember that these are the three ossicles, and then the tympanic membrane. And then this simply means that you have to be able to label the structure of the human ear. Only those parts which are on your examination guideline together with their functions. And then use scientific terminology. And then you still remember that the Eustachian tube, which is this part, and then it is filled with air, 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 sorry, and then it is filled with air. And then we have the three ossicles, which consist of a bone, not a cartilage. Okay, and then when we move to the process of hearing, so please, learners, this is very important. The following keywords must be there when you describe hearing. So it simply means that when you describe hearing, so you have to make sure that you also include these keywords. And then the part of the ear, you remember we have the pinna, and then this is what you have to say. The pinna, it traps the sound waves. It traps the sound waves and directs them into the auditory canal. So you are not allowed to just say the pinna, it traps the sound and directs them into the auditory canal, but it traps the sound waves. And then the second one, the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane, it vibrates and transmits the vibrations to the ossicles in the middle ear. Please, not the tympanic membrane vibrates and transmits the sound. It doesn't transmit the sound, but it transmits the what? The vibrations to the ossicles in the middle ear. And then another thing, uh, line number three, we have the ossicles now. The ossicles amplify the vibrations and carry them via the middle ear to the membrane of the oval window. And then the oval window, it vibrates and causes the pressure waves in the inner ear. So please make sure that when you write this statement, you also have to include what the pressure waves. The oval window, it vibrates and causes the pressure waves. Where? In the inner ear. And then the cochlea, 
These vibrations causes the sensory cells in the organ of Koti. So please make sure that again you remember to include the organ of Koti. The vibration causes the sensory cells where in the organ of Koti to be stimulated in the cochlea and nerve impulses are generated. And then the last part of the statement, the auditory nerve, what does uh, the auditory nerve, uh, uh, this is what we have, okay, with the auditory nerve, it transmits the nerve impulse to the cerebrum to be interpreted. It doesn't transmit the sound. So please remember here, the auditory nerve, it transmits the nerve impulse to the cerebrum to be interpreted. So please, learners, remember that when you describe hearing, all these words which are circled in red, you also have to include them. The sound wave, I'm going to repeat this again. The peanut traps the sound wave. It doesn't trap the sound only, the sound wave, and directs them to the auditory canal. And then the tympanic membrane, it vibrates and transmits the vibrations here. Please don't say that the tympanic membrane, it vibrates and transmits the sound. It doesn't transmit the sound, but it transmits the vibrations to the ossicles in the middle ear and then the ossicles they amplify the vibrations and carry them via the middle ear to the membrane of the oval window and then the oval window on this line it vibrates and causes the pressure waves in the inner ear and then in the cochlea these vibrations they cause the sensory cells in the organ of Koti like as I have said Please remember that to mention this um, organ of Koti. To be stimulated in the cochlea and the nerve impulse are generated. And then the last point, the auditory nerve, it transmits the nerve impulse. Most of you, you make a mistake here. Most of you, you will be saying the nerve impulse, the auditory nerve, it transmits the sound. It doesn't transmit the sound now. It transmits the nerve impulses to the cerebrum to be interpreted. So please, this is how you have to describe hearing. And then we have a flow diagram here, which shows balance. Okay. And then the semicircular canals, you still remember them here. And then this is how you have to describe a balance. The crystal in the semicircular canal, we have the semicircular canal here, are stimulated by changes in the direction and speed of the movement. The crystal where, this is the receptor which is found in the semicircular canals. And then they are stimulated by changes in the direction and speed of movement. And then we have the maculae. And circulars in and okay the macula sorry which is a receptor which is found in the circulars and utriculars and then here is the circulars and utriculars here and then they are stimulated by the changes in the position of the head so you still remember that with balance we have these two receptors which is the crystal found in the semicircular canal, and then we also have the macula in the circulars and utriculars. And then they are stimulated by the changes in the position of the head. So please make sure that you write these first two bullets in a correct format. Crystal in the semicircular canals are stimulated by the changes in the direction and speed of movement. But the macula in the circulars and utriculars they are stimulated by the changes in the position of the head. So please make sure that you get these two bullets correct. And then when stimulated, the crystal and macula, then they will convert what? The stimuli received into a nerve impulse. So it means that these two receptors, which are crystal and macula, and then they will convert the what? The stimuli which has been received into a what? Into a nerve impulse. And then the nerve impulse are transported along the auditory nerve to the cerebellum to be interpreted. 
and then the last statement, it will be the cerebellum, then send the impulse way to the muscles uh, to restore balance. So please remember that this is how you have to describe balance or the role of the ear in maintaining balance. Remember your what? Remember your receptors, the cristae and maculae, cristae in the semicircular canals, and then maculae in circulars and utriculars. And then you have to remember again that there is a cristae. It is responsible for what? It will be stimulated by the changes in the direction and speed of the movement. And then bullet number two, the maculae, it is only stimulated by changes in the position of the head. So please make sure that you write these two statements in a correct way. And then crystal and maculae, again, they convert the what the stimuli received into nerve impulse. And then the nerve impulse are transported along the what the auditory nerve. We have a small part here of the auditory nerve. And then to be interpreted where? At the cerebellum. And then the cerebellum then send impulses to the muscles to restore balance. And then we have a question here from, the, from one of the previous question papers. And then this is our diagram here. You look at these three bones. And then it is the what? The ossicles. And then we have part number I, number F, number G, and number H. And then here we have our question here. And in older people, part number F, here is part number F of the ear may harden. And then it means that it becomes hard. Explain how this condition may lead to hearing loss. If part number F is hard, and then you have to explain how this condition may lead to hearing loss. And then this is how you have to answer this question. The oval window, which is part number F, or you can just say part number F will not vibrate. So it means that if part number F, which is the oval window, becomes hard, and then it won't be able to vibrate freely. And then fewer vibrations will be carried over to the fluid in the cochlea or the inner ear. So it means that if the oval window doesn't vibrate freely and then what is going to happen and then we will have fewer vibrations that is why we are saying that fewer vibrations will be carried over to the fluid in the cochlea or the inner ear and then this is what will happen after that and then fewer pressure waves will form in the cochlea and then there will be less stimulation of the organ of Koti. so it means that if we have fewer pressure waves in the cochlea, and then it means that there will be less stimulation of what? Of the organ of Koti. And then if um, the organ of Koti becomes less stimulated, then it means that fewer impulses will be transmitted to the cerebrum, leading to what? To hearing loss. And now we move to another topic, okay, which is the endocrine system. So please remember that with endocrine system, you have to study the functions of the hormones. And then before that, know your glands. Glands and the hormones which are being secreted by that lens and the functions of those uh, what, hormones. And then when you look at our diagram here, we have the first gland, which is the hypothalamus, and then it secretes which hormone? It secretes ADH. So please make sure that you know the function of ADH. So, and then our second gland, we have the pituitary gland or hypophysis, and then which secretes FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, and then thyroid stimulating hormone, which is TSH, and then LH, luteinizing hormone, and then the growth hormone, which is GH, and prolactin. So, please make sure that you know the functions of 
all these hormones. And then number three, we have the thyroid gland. This is the thyroid gland, and then it secretes which hormone? It secretes thyroxine, the functions of thyroxine again. And then we also have the adrenal glands here. Yeah, they are above the kidneys, adrenal glands. And then they secrete adrenaline and aldosterone. Please, again, the functions of these hormones, adrenaline and aldosterone. And then the pancreas, and then the pancreas at number five. And then you remember that it secretes insulin and glucagon. And then the functions of both insulin and glucagon again. And then we also have the ovaries which secrete oestrogen and progesterone. And then we have uh, the testes, they secrete testosterone. So please remember that to revise this. You can even use this diagram. It is also there on your mind, the gap. Use this diagram just write that lens. You write your gland and then the hormone it secretes and then after that the function of that hormone. And now we move to homeostasis. Homeostasis maintaining a constant internal environment. And then let us look at the general sequence of events in a negative feedback mechanism. And then the first thing that will take place or that will happen in a negative feedback mechanism, it is an imbalance uh, or an imbalance will be detected. And then here we have uh, our example here. We are going to use uh, the negative feedback mechanism uh, between thyroxine and thyrox uh, TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. So step number one, an imbalance will be detected and then number two, a control center is stimulated. And then with our example, if an imbalance is detected, and then let us look at what we have here. The thyroxine levels, uh, for example, they increase above normal. Uh, okay, if we have high amounts of thyroxine, and then what is going to happen? A control center is stimulated, and then it means that the pituitary gland will be stimulated. And then step number three, control center responds. The pituitary gland produces less TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. And then step number four, message is sent to the target organs. So it means that low TSH levels stimulates the thyroid glands. And then step number five, the target organ responds. And then it responds by secreting less thyroxine. And then step number six, it opposes or reverses the imbalance. Then the thyroxine level in, uh, decreases. And then balance is restored. So this is a general sequence of events in a negative feedback mechanism. Please remember that step number one, an imbalance will be detected. And then after that, a control center will be stimulated control center response, and then a message it will be sent to the target organs, and then the target organ will respond, and then it will oppose or reverse the imbalance, and then balance is restored. And then with the negative feedback mechanism between thyroxine and TSH, this is what will happen. Thyroxine levels increases above level, uh, normal level, or when the level of thyroxine is high, and then what is going to happen? The hypothesis or pituitary gland will be stimulated and then it will produce less TSH. And then low TSH levels stimulates the thyroid gland to secrete what? Less thyroxine. And then thyroxine level decreases and then thyroxine levels return to normal. So please learn us Make sure that you go and revise or even drill the negative feedback mechanisms controlling each of the following in the body. Please make sure that you know the negative feedback mechanism of thyroxine levels. You remember that this one, it has to do with thyroxine and TSH. And then blood glucose levels, blood carbon dioxide levels, water balance, which is osmoregulation, and salt and FSH and 
progesterone. Now we move to the disorders or defects. And then we will look at the causes and symptoms of the disorders. You still remember that we have this disorders caused by an imbalance in the levels of thyroxine. And then you remember that it will cause what goiter and then blood glucose, it will cause diabetes mellitus, which is also known as, uh, most of the time you refer to this one as sugar diabetes. It is diabetes mellitus. And then causes and symptoms of the following disorders of the nervous system. So please make sure that you revise the causes and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and causes and symptoms of multiple sclerosis. And then again, this is what we have, the nature and treatment of the following visual defects using diagrams, short-sightedness, please just go and revise this, long-sightedness, astigmatism, and then we also have cataracts. And then again, another thing which is very important, the causes and treatment of the following hearing defects, middle ear infection, just go and revise this and then uh, with the use of the chromas, and then deafness, the use of hearing aids and cochlear implants. And now we move to thermoregulation. Let us now move to thermoregulation. And then please look at this diagram that we have on our slide. So this is a diagram which shows uh, or which represents thermoregulation. And then on this side, we have thermoregulation on a hot day. This is what is going to happen. The hypothalamus is stimulated or will be stimulated and send an impulse to the blood vessels. And then the blood vessels dilate or become wider and then this is called vasodilation. So please remember that when you describe thermoregulation on a hot day. So this is what you have to say. And then more blood flows to the skin. And then please, instead of saying more blood flows to the skin, so this is what you have to say. More blood is sent to the capillary veins in the surface of the skin. So it means that you have to replace this bullet with this one. More blood is sent to the capillary veins in the surface of the skin. And then after that, more heat is lost from the skin and more blood is sent to the sweat glands. And then we have the sweat glands here. The sweat glands, they become more active and then more sweat is released. Look at the sweat here. And then evaporation of the sweat cools the skin. So this is thermoregulation on a hot day. And then let us look at this side. We have thermore uh, thermoregulation on a cold day. Hypothalamus is stimulated and sent impulse to the blood vessels. Okay. Okay. And then after that, the blood vessels constrict or become narrower. And then this is called vasoconstriction. And then instead of saying less blood flows to the skin. So this is what you have to say. Less blood is sent to the capillary veins in the surface of the skin. And then after that, less heat is lost from the skin. Less blood is sent to the sweat glands. And then the sweat glands, they become less active. And then less sweat, there is no sweat or here, yeah, or we have less. Less sweat is released. And then there is less evaporation of sweat and less cooling of the skin. So please remember that with thermoregulation, this is also important. Therm uh, thermoregulation on a hot day and on a cold day. So please, when you revise, use these diagrams. 
So the most important thing here, you have to remember that you have to replace this bullet, bullet number one, of more blood flows to the skin. And then this is what you have to say, more blood is sent to the capillary veins in the surface of the skin. And then on this side, instead of saying less blood flows to the skin, and then it is better if you say that less blood is sent to the capillary veins in the surface of the skin. And then we move to the plant hormones. Let us move to the plant hormones. And then now we look at the role of auxins in phototropism and the role of auxins in geotropism. So please, again, you have to revise this. And then under phototropism, the role of auxin, bullet number one, we have uh, auxin. It is produced at the tip of the, uh, tip of the stem or shoot. And then after that, it will move downward evenly. And then the even distribution brings about the equal growth on all the sides of the stem. And then as a result, the stem grows upward. When the stem is exposed to unilateral light or light from one side only, and then what will happen? The oxygen concentration, you know that it will be high on the darker side, or oxygen will move to the darker side, and then as you know that light destroys oxygen, or again we can also say that oxygen is sensitive to light, so it means that it will move to the darker side. And then more growth occurs on the darker side, because oxygen stimulate growth on the darker side. And then as a result, the stem bends towards the light or it bends towards the direction of the light. So please remember this. Oxygen is produced at the stem, at the tip of the stem or the shoot. And then after that, it will move downward evenly. And then the even distribution brings about equal growth on all the sides of the stem. And then as a result, you remember that the stem will now grow up white. And then after that, when the stem is exposed to unilateral light or when light shines on a plant or on a stem on only one side, and then what will happen? You remember that oxygen is sensitive to light and then it will move to the darker side. And then the oxygen concentration will be high on the darker side. And then we also have here light destroys oxygen. Okay, like as we have said that oxygen is sensitive to light and then it will move to the darker side. And then more growth occurs on the darker side because oxygen stimulates the growth on the darker side. And then as a result, the stem will now bend towards the direction of the light. So this is the role of oxygen in phototropism. And then let us look at the role of oxygen in geotropism. Oxygen is produced at the tip of the roots. Oxygen, and then it will move upwards evenly. And then this even distribution brings about equal growth on all sides of the root. And then as a result, the root grows downward. But when the root is placed horizontally, only one side is exposed to gravity. So it means that when the root, if we take a root and then we place it horizontally, and then only one side will be exposed to gravity. And then the oxygen concentration will be high on the lower side of the root. And then gravity, you remember that it attracts oxygen. So more growth occurs on the upper side of the root because oxygen on the lower side, it inhibits the growth and then as a result the root bends downwards so please remember this the role of oxygen in geotropism and then we have a diagram here which shows phototropism and then let us look at the first uh, on our diagram here we have this plant here and then they say oxygen is made here, okay, at the tip of the stem. And then we have light here. And then it moves down the stem. Oxygen diffuses down the shoot, stimulating growth. And then on our second plant here, we have light here. And then light shines on this plant, 
only on this side. And then you still remember that we said that because oxen is sensitive to light and then it will move toward to the darker side. Okay, oxen here makes cells to grow faster. And then again, as I have said that when a light shines on this plant, uh, only on this side, because oxen is sensitive to light and then it will move to the darker side. And then it means that the darker side, it will now grow faster than the brightly lit side. And then you see this is what happens. And then our plant will bend towards the direction of what? Of the light. Okay, geotropism, we have our plant here and then our plant is placed horizontally. And then if a plant is laid on its side, oxen gathers in the lower side, half of the stem and the root. Okay, we have our plant here and then which has been placed horizontally and then it moves, it means that oxen will move to the lower side. But you still remember that oxen in roots, it inhibits growth. So it means that the upper side now, it will grow faster than the lower side. And then our plant, our roots will bend downward. And then on this one, we have oxen slows growth in the root. So the root curves downward. And then it stimulates the growth in the shoot. So the stem curves upwards. So this is geotropism. Okay, we have an activity here. It is a question from one of our previous question papers. And then let us look at this question or the activity. And then it was question 1.5. The diagram below shows the growth movement of a part of a plant towards a stimulus. Okay, we have our plant here and then we have our stimulus, which is A. All right. And then question 1.5.1. What growth movement is represented in the diagram? Okay, and then the growth movement, it will be phototropism. That will be phototropism. And then identify the stimulus labeled as A. What is stimulus number A? And then let us look at our memo. It is light. The stimulus number A, it is light. Name the growth hormone that is responsible for the growth movement named in question 1.5.1. And then the growth hormone, we know that it will be oxen. It will be oxen. And then will a high concentration of the growth hormone named in question 1.5.3 stimulate or inhibit growth in the roots? You remember that we said that it will inhibit, that will, it will inhibit in the roots. And then question 1.5.5, name the phenomenon where the buds at the tip of the plant regulate the growth of the lateral branches. And then that will be apical dominance. That will be apical dominance. Okay. And then we also have this guy again on this slide. And then he is saying, thank you, good luck with your examinations. And then before uh, we move to the end, okay, I think we are done with our presentation for today. So please remember, please remember, I'm just going to scroll again very fast on this slide. Please remember that I have said that when you prepare for your final examination and then when you have your notes, you will be having your notes and your previous question papers. And then again, don't forget again, please, to use your examination guideline. It is very important. And then another thing which I have said that with the format of the question paper, I'm sure that you are now used to this format. It is section A and section B, no more section e, C. Don't bother about section C, which is the essay. We are no more having essays in life sciences, uh, which was section C in the past. Okay, question four. So we are now only having section A and section number B. Section A, 50 marks, 50 marks. Just make sure that you get uh, out of this 50 for section A, make sure that you get maybe 30 and above or even 40. 
it is possible for you to get 40 and above for section A. And then section B, out of 100 marks, 100 marks, like as I have said that, it is question 2 and question 3, question 2, 50 marks. 50 marks and question 3, again, 50 marks. And then you still remember that in section A, we also have the data response questions, which is question 1.4 and question 1.5. And then with the structure of the paper, uh, the distribution of the topics, again, for our coming examination for paper one, you still remember that reproduction in vertebrates. Please make sure that you get this eight marks. Get this eight marks. And then human reproduction, 41 marks. You can still get 30, 30 and above, or 40, or even this 41. Responding to the environment, 54 marks. Responding to the environment, here we have the plants. This one, it is human nervous system, which is out of 54 marks. And then this 13 marks, just make sure that you prepare yourself and then you will get this 13 marks. And then endocrine and homeostasis, you can still get this 34 marks if you have prepared yourself uh, sufficiently. And then the technical points, again, when writing the exam, like as I have said, please let us remember I have said that you have to start each and every question on a new page. Question 1, question 2, question 3. At the end of question 1 in section A, maybe it will be question 1.5. And then when we are done with question 1.5, just make sure that when you move to question 2, you start question 2 on a new page. And then 2.1, 2.1.1, 2.1.2, and then maybe up to 2.1.4 or 2.4 or 2.5. Question 3 again. Make sure that you start question 3 on a new page. And then after each sub-question, draw a line. Let us make an example maybe with question 2. Question 2.1. And then under 2.1, you know that it will be 2.1.1, 2.1.2, 2.1.3, 2.1.5. And then you draw a line. And then 2.2. Please remember that after each sub-question, you draw a line. Your graphs, tables, and drawings. When you draw your graphs, you draw with a pencil and then you label with a pen. And even the tables, draw with a pencil and then you label with a pen. And then drawings, maybe you will be asked or required to draw the structure of what, the stem cell or the uh, an ovum. So please make sure that you draw with a pencil, but then you label with a pen. And then again, everything that we draw in life sciences, graphs, tables, drawings, please remember that we have to also include the what, the headings or the caption, especially with the graphs. Most of the time, some, some of you, you forget to to write the captions or the headings of your graphs. And then another thing which is very important, when you draw, use a ruler or protractor and compass when drawing the graphs. And then another thing which is very important here, learners, remember with the pie chart, please make sure that you also include your calculations. If you have been asked to draw a pie chart, write your caption or heading and then after that, you do your calculations. Your calculations must also be there on your answer sheet. And then after that, you draw your pie chart using your protractor, not using a container of a Zbix or Zambak. And then please make sure that you do that. Show your calculations. And then another thing, okay, under reproduction in vertebrates, Please just go and revise all these reproductive strategies. Make sure that you get this full eight marks. And then amniotic egg, the functions of the chorion, amnion, alontes. Please make sure that you revise these things. Especially bullet number two of ovipari, ovovivipari, and vivipari. Like as I have said that it has been found that you cannot distinguish between these different types of reproductive strategies. And then again, most of you, you are unable to apply the knowledge to examples. So please make sure. I know that most of you, you are mastering bullet number A, number one, external fertilization and internal fertilization, precocial and altricial and parental care. 
but ovipari of ovivipari and vivipari. Please just go and revise this. Know the definitions of this. And then I also gave you a summary of these definitions. And then here are examples. We have the examples here on this slide. And then examples of the mammals with viviparas. And then over viviparas, we have examples here. And then another thing which is also important, I also gave you a summary here of these three reproductive strategies, ovipari, ovovivipari, and vivipari. You remember we have said that ovipari, it can either be external or internal. Ovovivipari, it is internal, and then vivipari, in, uh, uh, also internal. And then development of the embryo. Okay, and then precocial and altricial. Here are the definitions. And then a summary again of precocial and altricial. Remember that Development of the body well developed with precocial and then with altricial underdeveloped and then eyes after birth for precocial they are open and then they are closed on this side and then yolk amount in a greater quantity of yolk with precocial and then altricial you still remember that we said that we have lower quantity of yolk. And then the four membranes, extra embryonic membrane, and then of the amniotic uh, egg, and then amnion, chorion, allantes, and yolk sac, and then please go through that. And then under human reproduction, like as I have said that you remember that uh, human reproduction, it will be out of 41 marks. Just prepare yourself sufficiently and then you, you will, it is possible for you to get this 41 marks. Remember the diagram, diagram of the male reproductive system and then all the labels and the functions of all those labels which are on your examination guideline, please remember them. And then again your lens, you remember we talked about that lens and then seminal vesicle, prostate gland and corpus gland like as I have said that and now I'm referring them to SPC, S the top one, seminal vesicle, middle one, prostate and then the bottom one, copper's gland, and the functions of this glands. And then again, we have to know all the other labels and together with what their functions, please. And then the same with the female reproductive system, all the parts from the examination guideline and the function of those parts. And then another thing which is very important, you remember that I have said that uh, most of you, you don't know the functions of what? Of the fallopian tubes transport the mature ovum as well as the developing zygote in the direction of the uterus. So please just go and revise this structure. Know the labels, know the functions of those labels. And then the gametes. Be able to draw your gametes. Please, the structure of the sperm cell and the ovum. Please make sure that you know these gametes. Know uh, how to draw them, be able to draw them and to label. And then another thing which is also important, it is what the functions of all these parts. When you look at, we have these parts, okay, and the functions, here are the functions. And then remember again, another thing which is very important, let us, let us say you come across a question uh, which, is, uh, which is like this. Uh, what are the structural suitabilities of the sperm cell? So with the structural suitabilities or the adaptations, please remember that you have to mention, you will mention a part and then the characteristic of this part and then after that, the function of that part. And then gametogenesis, we have spermatogenesis, genesis, and then like as I have said, remember that with this ones, you are not allowed to describe these two using your own words. You have to describe them the way they have been described on your examination guideline. So please, this is very important. Just make sure that you revise these two processes, spermatogenesis and oogenesis. Revise them, drill them, please. And then again on this slide, again, it is the hormones. Just go and revise, revise these hormones. Even on your previous question papers, try to do um, questions which are based on this 
on some of the question papers you'll find that they give you diagrams like this one and then please just go through those questions try to when you revise make sure that you go through such questions and then we have our hormones here and then we also did this the ovarian cycle and uterine cycle all the events that are taking place in the ovary and then all the events taking place in what inside the uterus and then the stages this is very important let us the stages between ovulation and implantation please go through this again and then uh, under the response to the environment, you may never system. The difference between never system and endocrine system, just go and make sure that you know this. Okay, the structure of the human eye, accommodation and pupillary mechanism. Please, this is very important. Accommodation and pupillary mechanism, this is what we have here. And then again, you remember that I have also said that on bullet number two, let us look here. Suspensory ligaments tighten. They become tight. Don't say that suspensory ligaments, they contract. They are not contracting. And then here, light rays are focused on the retina. Please. And then another thing which is very important on the human ear, these keywords. Remember that you have to include these keywords when you describe hearing. Please. And then the role of the ear in balance, the crystal in the semicircular canals. The first two bullets, please just make sure that you master these first two bullets. Please. Okay. And then endocrine system, once you know your glands, the glands and then the hormones being secreted by those glands and the functions of those hormones. And then your negative feedback mechanism. You remember all this negative feedback mechanism. Just make sure that you revise them. Just make sure that you revise and you also drill them. Thyroxine levels, blood glucose levels, blood carbon dioxide, water balance, which is osmoregulation, salt, FSH, and progesterone. And then the disorders, causes and symptoms of all the disorders that we have mentioned, please. And then thermoregulation on a hot and a cold day. Just go and revise that. And then again, we also have what? The plant hormones. Plant hormones, the role of oxygen in phototropism, the role of oxygen in geotropism. Just make sure that you revise this, please. And then we come to our last slide again. Which, is, uh, which brings us to the end of our presentation for today. So please, good luck with your examination. Thank you.